In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Stir, Stir up, up the, the wills, wills of your faithful, faithful people, Lord, Lord God, God, and open our ears to the words of your prophets, that anointed by your Spirit, we may testify to your light, 
through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first lesson is from the 61st chapter of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord God has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins, they shall raise up the former devastations, they shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations, and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. Here ends the reading. We read Psalm 126 responsibly. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, then were we like those who dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter, and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad indeed. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the watercourses of Negev. Those who sow it with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying the seed, will come again with joy, shouldering their sheaves. The second lesson is from the fifth chapter of First Thessalonians. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. Here ends the reading. The Holy Gospel lesson according to St. John, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, 
nor Elijah, nor the prophet. John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. This week we continue our Advent journey of waiting and preparing for Jesus' return. In the second lesson for today, which serves as the basis for the sermon, St. Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica, a port city in present-day Greece, located on a trade route that connected the Balkans to the rest of Greece. The congregation had been established by Paul after some Jews converted to Christianity in response to his preaching there for only a few weeks. Some biblical scholars think this is the first letter Paul wrote, and so could be the oldest portion of Scripture in the New Testament. The Thessalonian Christians are worried because they had expected Jesus to return very soon. Now some of the converts have died, and they are worried these have missed Jesus' return. In the second lesson for today, Paul is concluding his first letter to them, encouraging them to remain faithful and blameless as they continue to wait for Jesus' return. In his message of encouragement, St. Paul lists some marks they should live and exhibit as, faithful, as a faithfully waiting church. These are actions and characteristics that a faithfully waiting church will exhibit. It is important for us to consider these marks, for we, like the Thessalonians, are in the advent of waiting for Jesus' return. Paul's message to the Thessalonians about marks of a faithfully waiting church in this time of waiting for and preparing for Jesus' return are imparted for considering our faithfulness as the church, the people of God, and for us as a congregation of the church. First, the faithfully waiting church is a church that rejoices always in Jesus Christ. It is a church that, even in the midst of obstacles and difficult decisions, proclaims confidence and hope in God's promises. This is joy, this is rejoicing, to stand firmly on God's promises, confident that they are ours for eternity. The temptation is to be people who do not always rejoice. This is particularly true for rural and small town ministries. Too often we have seen congregations decrease in size and attendance, seen communities change through either decline or increase in population, seen congregations grow older in their average age of members. Some have a hard time meeting their budget, and too often there is a fear of viability. Will the congregation survive? In the call process and in conversations in the congregation, we often hear, we hope we can get attendance up. We hope we can increase our giving. We hope to get the young ones back. We hope we get, can get people to join. We hope we'll be here in 50 years. I guess these are okay until you realize that is not rejoicing. That is not even hope, though that is the word that is used. Rather, that is actually passively wishing something would change without us having to likewise change. Listen, listen to how 
the rejoicing that St. Paul is talking about sounds. We know that God has called us to be witnesses to Jesus in this community. We know there are people in our community with whom we need to share the gospel. We are committed to fulfilling the ministry of Jesus Christ in this community through this congregation. We are committed to keep Jesus as the focus of and reason for our ministry. All our programs are to serve Him and His mission rather than tradition and self-preservation. We are willing to try new programs and activities and to do things differently in order to serve faithfully in our day. We are willing to respond to God's call to do ministry to this congregation by giving the amounts of money, time, and talents it requires to get the ministry done. Each of us has a vital part in the ministry of this congregation, and that means I will be active in this congregation and its support as long as I am possibly able. And because of God's promises of grace and life in Jesus Christ, we are confident He is guiding and blessing our efforts so that in Him we cannot fail. Do you hear the difference? I hope we can. Sounds hollow and empty next to, I know and I believe that God is with us. And I am committed to God and Jesus' mission. St. Paul says the faithfully waiting church rejoices always, living and active in the confidence of God's promises. A second mark of the faithfully waiting church is prayer without ceasing. I often ask confirmation classes, how can we always be in prayer? Does it mean we always have our hands folded and eyes closed? We would not be much good for living in this way. The problem many have with understanding Paul's words is people often limit prayer to our talking to God. We get hung up on telling God what we want or what we want Him to do for us. And we think our prayer hasn't worked until we get what we prayed for. The problem with this approach is highlighted by the story that was related by a mother. One night at dinner, a mother asked her four-year-old son to say grace. Heads bowed and hands folded, we waited. After a few moments of silence, I looked up at him. He glanced at me, then over at his father, and then back to me again. Finally he said, But if I thank God for the broccoli, won't he know I'm lying? You see, prayer is really communication with God. And this communication is two ways. Us to God which is received, and God to us, which is received. In order for it to be prayer, there must be a complete circuit to the communication. This is how we can be in prayer without ceasing. When we are not talking to God, we are listening to Him. God communicates with us in many ways. Sermons, reading scripture, meditation, through other people such as family members and friends, and through situations we face in life. Prayer is to be in communication with God in all facets and at all times in our lives. Prayer is communication with God about everything. An example of this is the Jewish father in one of my favorite films, Fiddler on the Roof. 
The character speaks to God like he is right there beside him. He challenges God to answer him. And he finally knows God's presence and answers through the struggles of his life. St. Paul says the faithfully waiting church is a praying church that is talking to and listening to God without ceasing in all its decisions and choices. The third mark of the faithfully waiting church is being thankful in all circumstances. This mark is a particular pitfall in our society which glamorizes independence and individual achievement. These are amplified in rural areas where people had to be self-reliant because of distance from services and even other people. We hear it manifested something like this. We worked hard to get what we have. Translated, we earned what we've got. We have only ourselves to thank for what we have. Nobody helped us. We can do what we want with what we have. It's nobody's business but our own. But this flies in the face of Scripture and what it tells us. If we truly believe God's Word, we know that all we have is a gift of God's grace. Sure, we worked hard for it, but it was only God's grace that gave us the ability strength, skills, and opportunity to work. Truly, all we have and all that we are is a gift of grace from God. Therefore, we are to give thanks to God in all things, for without His grace, we are nothing. This is what Paul means by this third mark of the faithfully waiting church being thankful in all circumstances. It's this humble spirit of thanksgiving that Paul calls us to today. And especially are we to give thanks for the Lord Jesus, whose advent we are celebrating. He is the one who died for us, just as we are. He sets us free from sin and death and all we might fear, he gives us reason for thanksgiving no matter what. For nothing can ever separate us from His great love. Absolutely nothing. And if that isn't reason enough for thanksgiving in all circumstances, nothing else is. We are indeed ever so grateful for this unspeakable gift God has given to all of us. The grace and love of Jesus Christ, our Lord. This leads to the fourth mark of the faithfully waiting church. This is a church that does not quench the Holy Spirit. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit appeared as tongues of fire over the disciples' heads. It was the Holy Spirit who gave life and power to the witness of Peter and the other disciples after Pentecost. They were filled with the fire of the Holy Spirit. We confess in the Nicene Creed that this same Holy Spirit spoke through the prophets. The Holy Spirit inspires Scripture and those who faithfully speak God's Word. Using the image of fire for the work of the Holy Spirit, Paul tells Christians not to quench the Spirit. Don't put out its power and life. The Holy Spirit works through the proclaimed Word of God. And so God warns the congregation not to despise the words of prophets, those who faithfully proclaim God's word, but rather to carefully test everything and hold fast to what is good and godly, abstaining from every form of evil. This means the faithfully waiting church follows God's leading through the Holy Spirit, looking for new opportunities for growth, for new directions for ministry, and not being fearful of change. Older established congregations can have problems with this. All too often they get so hung up on tradition and the way things have been done in the past that they can't see the possibility of doing anything else in any other way. 
and so are blinded to new opportunities of ministry. They can get so tied emotionally into lifeless things and patterns of doing things that ministry is dragged down and stifled. They get so caught up in sentimental remembrances of past ministry that they cannot see the future and what it may require. That something that worked 30 or 60 years ago may not be effective now. St. Paul says that the faithfully waiting church is willing to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. The faithfully waiting church does not quench the fire of the Holy Spirit in its midst. The faithfully waiting church sees change not as something to be shunned and ignored or avoided, but as opening doors to new ministry opportunities, new challenges, new programs, new ways of doing things, and new people. Alexander, an elder who was nearly deaf, attends worship services every Sunday, good weather or bad. Once he was asked why he bothered attending since he couldn't hear much, his reply, I want people to know which side I'm on. Alexander believed his mark of attendance made a difference witnessed to his faith in Jesus. So also, St. Paul holds up these marks of a faithfully waiting church to the Thessalonians and to us. The marks of a church that is alive because Jesus is the crucified and risen Lord. A church that rejoices always, a church that prays without ceasing, a church that gives thanks in all circumstances, a church that receives and discerns God's word and does not quench the fire and the leading of the Holy Spirit. Paul holds up these marks so that we might examine ourselves and reflect on where we might grow as individual disciples of Jesus and as a congregation dedicated to the mission of God. None of these marks allow for an idle or passive Christian life or congregation. Note how all of Paul's marks are action words that are centered in God. The Holy Spirit, through these marks, leads us into active mission, witnessing to our loving God and our Savior, Jesus. The Holy Spirit does this so that, as St. Paul writes, we may be sanctified made holy by God in spirit, soul, and body, our entire selves, that we may be sound and blameless when Jesus returns. Alexander believed showing marks of faith made a difference. As a faithfully waiting church, the marks Paul presents to the Thessalonians and to us will make a difference to our witness also. May we have and show them as we wait and prepare for Jesus' return. Amen.
confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. God of power and might, Tear open the heavens and come quickly to this weary world. Hear our prayers for everyone in need. God of preachers and messengers, you have entrusted your church with the work of proclaiming good news. Strengthen the witness of bishops, pastors, deacons, church musicians, lay leaders, and all people who contribute their prayers and talents to public worship. Embed your word in their hearts. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of every living creature, you announce the year of your favor for all of creation. Extend your kindness and relief to endangered animals and plants. Strengthen the human beings who rely on the rhythms of nature to make their living. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of all peoples and nations, you plant us as your oaks of righteousness and ask us to take care for one another. Be present with the leaders of every nation as they govern. Give them a spirit of righteousness that your goodness and mercy is revealed through their actions. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of exiles and wanderers, you repair what was once destroyed. We pray for people who have been displaced from their homes by fire, flood, earthquake, or storm. Support the work of Lutheran World Relief, Lutheran Disaster Response, and all disaster relief organizations in their recovery efforts. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of the powerful and helpless, you clothe us with strength when our spirits are weak and weary. Bestow your spirit upon this congregation and empower us to comfort the people who turn to us in times of need. Make your church a place of refuge and healing. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Grant healing to those who suffer from illness or injury, especially Tom Brinkmeyer, Tom, Roland Contreras, Roland, Barry Lee Goldberg, Barry Lee, Joanne Hundemer, Joanne, Betty Holt, Betty, Orlin Nagley, Orlin, Marcus Brazier, Marcus, Tammy Browner, Tammy. Edwin Weiss, Edwin. Todd Kokarst, Todd. Janet Zapalak, and all those we now name. Give comfort to the dying and grant your presence and peace to all who mourn. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of sinners and saints, you offer joy even in the midst of our grief. We are grateful for the beloved, imperfect people whose lives testify to your radiant love especially those saints we name before you. Anoint all who mourn with the oil of gladness. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Draw near to us, O God, and receive our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom, and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Creator of the stars bless your advent waiting. 
the long-expected Savior fill you with love, the unexpected Spirit guide your journey, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Sound the Savior comes, the Savior promised long. Let every heart prepare a throne and every voice a song. He comes, the captives to release in Satan's prison. Go in peace, prepare the way of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.